I love Israel. I love Israel. I've been with Israel so long in terms of I've received some of my greatest honors from Israel. My father before me, incredible. My daughter Ivanka is about to have a beautiful Jewish baby. This is the world that you know. Israel. My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. I love Israel. I love Israel. I love Israel. It is my esteemed pleasure to introduce Mr. and Mrs. Donald Trump. Donald Trump, el documental definitivo. La Revolución Pacífica les presenta a continuación un documental inédito en la red. Hasta ahora nadie ha realizado un documental sobre Donald Trump desde este prisma, que repasa la vida y las raíces más profundas del actual presidente de los Estados Unidos y el número 45 que ocupa la Casa Blanca en Washington District, Columbia. Lo que verán a continuación desbancará miles de teorías que defienden a Donald Trump como el salvador de la humanidad y dará luz a muchos que desconocen los planes de la marioneta más efectiva de la historia de la Corporación de los Estados Unidos de América. Abróchense los cinturones, porque aquí comenzamos. I love Israel. Antes que nada, conozcamos un poco la historia de la familia Trump y cómo alcanzó su status quo actual. Trump es un apellido de origen germánico, derivado de la palabra Jomel que significa tambor, o en inglés, drums. El nombre está registrado en Karlstadt desde el siglo XVII y se ha escrito de muchas maneras diferentes, incluyendo las siguientes. Básicamente, la familia de Donald Trump es de ascendencia alemana. Sus abuelos, Friedrich Fred Trump y Elizabeth Christ, nacieron en Karlstadt, en Baviera, el sur de Alemania. Fred Trump emigró en 1885 a Estados Unidos desde Hamburgo, Alemania, a bordo del buque SS Eider, y se convirtió en ciudadano estadounidense en 1892 en Seattle, en el estado de Washington. De Seattle, Fred viajó a Whitehorse, Alaska, para buscar su fortuna durante la fiebre del oro en Klondike, entre 1896 y 1899. Allí ya se le empezó a conocer como Sleazy Freddy o Freddy el Sórdido, y ahora entenderán por qué. Ya en el noroeste del Pacífico, Fred Trump dirigió operaciones sórdidas e ilegales en el White Horse Restaurant and Inn y el New Arctic Restaurant and Hotel en Bennett, en la Columbia Británica. Después veremos la importancia de la diosa Columbia en todo esto. Los intereses comerciales en sus negocios abastecían de lo prohibido en aquel momento. Compartían espacio con las guaridas del opio y los burdeles 
Por entonces había rumores de que las autoridades se estaban preparando para acabar con su tipo de guaridas de prostitución, tráfico de drogas y mala reputación. Pero dicen que Fred siempre estaba un paso por delante de la ley. Alrededor de mayo de 1901 cobró y se dirigió de nuevo a Alemania con su dinero. Al parecer, Fred volvió a Karlstadt y se casó con su antigua vecina, Elizabeth Christ. Sin embargo, algunas investigaciones apuntan a que Elizabeth, nacida en 1880, era realmente la hija de Philip Christ y Ana María Razón. Philip Christ era un familiar cercano de Fred Trump. Es decir, Freddy el Sórdido se casó con alguien de su propia sangre. Teniendo en cuenta que la población de Karlstadt es de apenas 1200 habitantes, es muy probable que su vecina tuviera parentesco con los Trump. En algunas sociedades el casamiento entre familiares está prohibido como una forma de incesto, mientras que en otros es legal incluso común. En la mayoría de los estados de América, la actividad sexual con sanguínea está penalizada como incesto. Pero esto no nos sorprende, puesto que su nieto, el bueno de Donald, ya ha sido acusado en numerosas ocasiones de mantener una relación incestuosa con su propia hija, Ivanka Trump. Y no lo decimos nosotros, lo dice él mismo. Pasen y vean. I don't think Ivanka would do that inside the magazine, although she does have a very nice figure. If Ivanka weren't my daughter, perhaps I'd be dating her. You know? Stop <laughs> it! Oh, it's so weird! Stop it! You know it. what? You are sick! Yeah. 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 No, well, you're terrible. known for saying is outrageous that things, Mr. Just like Trump. Me. Who are you, Woody <laughs> Allen? <laughs> <laughs> We want to know a little bit more about you guys, so we play this game here. It's called Fave Five. She's tough. Okay, Ivanka, <laughs> what's the favorite thing you have in common with your father? Either real estate or golf. Donald, with your daughter? Well, I was going to say sex, but I can't relate that. Part. <laughs> well, I was going to say sex, but I can't relate that. Part. On Howard Stern's radio show in 2004, and then again in 2006. By the way, your daughter. She's beautiful. A, can I say this? A piece of ass. Yeah. She looks more voluptuous than ever. She's and her, actually always been very voluptuous. It's she's tall. She's almost six feet tall. Saying last year in a Rolling Stone article, yeah, she's really something, and what a beauty that one. If I weren't happily married, and, you know, her father. My she daughter, is. Ivanka. Yeah. She's six feet tall. She's got the best body. Yeah, she's hot. Volviendo al bueno de Freddy el Sordido, él decidió cambiar su apellido durante su estancia en Alemania. ¿Estaba Fred Trump huyendo de la ley? En los juegos de cartas, una Trump Card o Carta Triunfal es una carta de juego que se eleva por encima de su rango normal. En otros contextos, el término Trump Card puede referirse a cualquier tipo de acción, autoridad o política que prevalece automáticamente sobre todas las demás. Por tanto, la carta triunfal del nuevo orden mundial ya ha sido jugada y está prevaleciendo sobre todas las demás, en este caso su apoyo incondicional al Estado de Israel. I speak to you today as a lifelong supporter and true friend of Israel. I am a newcomer to politics, but not to backing the Jewish state. I came here to speak to you about where I stand on the future of American relations with our strategic ally our unbreakable friendship and our cultural brother, the only democracy in the Middle East, the state of Israel. Thank you. And we will send a clear signal 
that there is no daylight between America and our most reliable ally, the State of Israel. That's right. Get that mic. Get that mic over there. This might shock you, but um, we have something in common. Good. Respect for human life. Thank you. Okay? Number one and number two. Okay? Number one, I'm opposed to the murder of unborn babies being legal. Number two, I'm opposed to our wasting our military in the Middle East on behalf of Zionist Israel. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let, let me just tell you that Israel is a very, very important ally of the United States, and we are going to protect them 100 percent. 100 percent. They've been our most reliable. Uh, it's our true friend over there, and we are going to protect Israel 100 percent percent and we're going to protect Israel 100 percent as to number one we all we're with you okay uh, one more we got to ask one more because that was a tough question on Israel huh? that was nasty whoa because that was a tough question on Israel huh? that was nasty whoa 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 are we all for Israel right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay go ahead Thank you. Thank you. Otro de los misterios es el origen del apellido Trump o Trump, ya que puede ser una variación de Trump o hacer sonar su propia trompeta o bocina. Es un apellido medieval inglés derivado del francés anterior al siglo VIII y que proviene de trompeur o fabricante de trompetas. De hecho, en el registro del buque SS Eider con el que viajó a Estados Unidos, lo registraron como un Trump. De cualquier manera, Fred Trump o Trump, a su llegada a Estados Unidos, tuvo que jugar una carta triunfal o Trump Card para ocultar su pasado y envolver su verdadero trasfondo. Los bisabuelos de Donald Christian Johannes Trump y Katerina Kober tuvieron ocho hijos, entre ellos Friedrich Trump o Freddy el Sórdido y Jacob Trump. Sin embargo, la bisabuela del actual presidente norteamericano, Katerina Kober, era de ascendencia judía askenazi. Otra de las cosas que sabemos es que Kober es un apellido alemán y de origen judío askenazi. Es un derivado del nombre personal Jacob o Jacob y del alemán Kober, que significa cesta o canasto. Por tanto, es un nombre metonímico para un fabricante de cestas o quizás un apodo para alguien que cargaba una cesta en la espalda. El área de Karlstadt, donde vivían en Alemania, comprendía las comunidades judías de Mainz, Speyer y Worms que se convirtieron en el centro de la comunidad judía durante la Edad Media. Thank you. Donald Trump es un antiguo miembro de la conspiración sionista que aflige a la sociedad. Es decir, Donald Trump es nada más y nada menos que un espectáculo secundario y una falsa medicina que ofrece milagros baratos para los problemas de Estados Unidos allí y en el extranjero. Donald no entró en cómo o por qué su padre había sido tan leal a Israel desde el día en que nació, 1946, pero su asociación personal cercana con Bunny Lindenbaum puede proporcionar algunas respuestas. Bunny Lindenbaum fue un fanático sionista ortodoxo, fue presidente del Consejo de la Comunidad Judía de Brooklyn 
y del Centro Judío de Brooklyn que está conectado directamente con la United Synagogue of America, el Congreso Sionista Mundial, el United Jewish Appeal, el National Jewish Welfare Board y el Mossad. Lindenbaum y el escandaloso Fred Trump usaron clandestinamente fondos del HUD, Departamento de Hogar y Desarrollo Urbano, y del Estado, para construir con ello un asilo y una base de poder judío en Brooklyn, para los sionistas europeos del Este que siguen practicando la mística hashídica del Chabad Lubavitch, con enormes y sustanciales ganancias a costa de los contribuyentes. Un portavoz del movimiento hasídico Chabad Lubavitch dice que la secta es sionista en su apoyo a Israel. Fred Trump y Bunny Lindenbaum estaban trabajando secretamente con el barón Otto von Bolschwing, la fuerza de defensa israelí, el Mossad y la recién formada CIA. Ellos afirman que mientras que los judíos son el pueblo elegido y creados a la imagen de Dios, los gentiles, es decir, los no judíos, no tienen este estatus y son efectivamente considerados subhumanos. Se permite que los Chabad existan como una poderosa fuerza internacional porque sirven a Israel de dos maneras. Primero, trabajando con el Mossad en inteligencia y segundo, como ideología extremista para alimentar los crímenes sionistas, así como un plan para alienar, dividir y polarizar permanentemente a las razas. Hoy día, Shabbat Lubavitch está entre los grupos hasídicos más grandes del mundo y es la organización religiosa judía más grande de todas. La vasta red de instituciones de Shabbat ha colocado al movimiento en la vanguardia de la vida comunal judía hoy día tanto en Estados Unidos como en otros centros de poder mundial. You know, you're really beautiful. And a woman that looks like that has to have her own special scent. Oh, thank you. Maybe, maybe you could tell me what you think of this scent. Hmm, I like that. This, this may be the best of all. Oh, you dirty boy, you. Oh, oh. Donald, I thought you were a gentleman. Ver a Rudy Giuliani vestido de mujer y a Donald Trump actuando como su amante no era una rutina humorística, sino más bien un ritual de humillación pública ante vuestros ojos, donde los miembros subordinados o iniciados se involucran en actividades propagandísticas de lo más sórdidas. A Rudy Giuliani siempre le ha gustado adoptar el papel de mujer, sin embargo. El exalcalde de la ciudad de Nueva York y actual consejero de ciberseguridad de Donald Trump, Rudy Giuliani, es un habitual comentarista invitado en Fox News y en otras cadenas del mainstream. Él era el alcalde de la ciudad cuando el 11 de septiembre de 2001, las Torres Gemelas y el World Trade Center 7 colapsaron.
Él fue un elemento esencial junto con la administración Bush. La monarquía absolutista de Arabia Saudí. Y los servicios de inteligencia israelíes para que las Torres Gemelas y el edificio 7, sin impacto de avión, se desvaneciesen. Además del Pentágono, atacado por un misil balístico, y con ello justificar una guerra contra el terror y las armas de destrucción masiva en Oriente Medio. El enemigo invisible perfecto. Can you give us any better idea of how much of the plane actually impacted the building? You know, it, it, it might have appeared that way, but from my close-up inspection, uh, there's no evidence of a plane having crashed anywhere near the Pentagon. And as I said, the only pieces left uh, that you can see are, are small enough that you could pick up in your hand. Uh, there are no large uh, tail sections, wing sections, uh, a fuselage, nothing like that anywhere around. So what do you think of my Trump home mattress collection by Serta? Listen, why don't you come work for me? What do you have in mind? Something you were born to do. Welcome to room nine. Looking good, number nine, looking good. Where's your dignity? Welcome to room nine. Looking good, number nine, looking good. Where's your dignity? Donald, you're probably the best known builder, uh, particularly of, of, of great buildings in the city. There's a great deal of question about whether or not the damage and, and the ultimate destruction of the buildings was caused by the airplanes, by architectural defect, or possibly by bombs or, or aftershocks. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, it was an architectural defect. You know, the World Trade Center was always known as a very, very strong building. Don't forget, that took a big bomb in the basement. Now, the basement is the most vulnerable place because that's your foundation, and it withstood that. And I got to see that area about three or four days after it took place because one of my structural engineers actually took me for a tour because he did the building. And I said, I can't believe it. The building was standing solid and half of the columns were blown out. I mean, so this was an unbelievably powerful building. Uh, if you know anything about structure, it was one of the first buildings that was built from the outside. The steel, the reason the World Trade Center had such narrow windows is that in between all the windows, you had the steel on the outside. So you had the steel on the outside of the building. That's why when I first looked, and you had big, heavy I-beams. When I first looked at it, I couldn't believe it because there was a hole in the steel. And this is steel that was, you remember the, the width of the windows of the World Trade Center, folks. I think, you, you know, if you were ever up there, they were quite narrow. And in between was this heavy steel. I said, how could a plane, even a plane, even a 767 or 747 or whatever it might have been, how could it possibly go through the steel? I happen to think that they had not only a plane, but they had bombs that exploded almost simultaneously. Because I just can't imagine anything being able to go through that wall. Most buildings are built with the steelers on the inside around the elevator shaft. This one was built from the outside, which is the strongest structure you can have, and it was almost just like a, uh, like a can of soup. You know, Donald, we were looking at pictures all morning long of that plane coming into uh, building number two, and when you see that uh, approach the, the far side, and then all of a sudden, within a matter of a millisecond, the explosion pops out the other side. Right. I just think that there was a plane with more than just fuel. I think, obviously, they were very big planes. They were going very rapidly. Uh, it just seemed to me that to do that kind of destruction is even more than a big plane, because you're talking about taking out steel, the heaviest caliber steel that was used on a building. I mean, these buildings were rock solid. And, uh, you know, it's just an amazing, it's an amazing thing. It's, this country is different today. And, and it's going to be different than it ever was for many years to come. Very profound statement and very true. Do you believe it's hundreds or thousands? I, I, I really don't. I really, 
I really don't want to say right now, Peter. I, I think it's going to be hor a horrible number. I, I saw people jumping out of the World Trade Center. I saw some of the firefighters who I know going in, into the building. So, And we were in a building in which we were trapped for about 10, 15 minutes. Are you talking about the... Did you go immediately to the Office of Emergency Management? No, I, I went down to the scene, and we set up a headquarters at 75 Barclay Street, which was right there with the police commissioner, the fire commissioner, mm -hmm. the head of emergency management. And we were operating out of there when we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. When we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. When we were told that the World Trade Center was going to collapse. We were trapped in the building for 10, 15 minutes and finally found an exit and got out, walked north. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated, by the Islamic fundamentalists. Mayor Rudy Giuliani visited Israel to show solidarity with terror victims. I sent my plane because I backed the mission for Israel 100%. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Thank you. Un total de 411 trabajadores de rescate murieron ese día junto con 343 bomberos y 23 policías que no habían sido advertidos de la implosión de los edificios. Como sí que conocían las altas esferas del gobierno norteamericano, incluido el alcalde Giuliani. Volviendo al padre de Donald Trump, parece muy improbable sino imposible que el escandaloso Fred Christ Trump hiciese algo en los círculos en los que se movía en Nueva York sin la colaboración y combinación de los políticos, funcionarios y la policía del Tammany Hall. La sociedad de San Tammany u Orden Colombina. La Orden Colombina también tenía sus logias masónicas. La Columbian Lodge en Boston es una de las más antiguas logias masónicas de los Estados Unidos, instituida en 1795 por Paul Revere. Columbia Pictures Columbia Records la CBS, Columbia Broadcast System, son algunos de los ejemplos del culto a la diosa por parte de los que controlan los mass media y el poder en Estados Unidos desde su formación. No olvidemos que la sede del poder político se encuentra en Washington, D.C. o Distrito de Columbia. La Tammany Hall no se convirtió en una máquina política disciplinada hasta que estuvo bajo la dirección de John Kelly, de 1872 al 86, el primero de los diez sucesivos jefes irlandeses americanos. Los hombres irlandeses dominaban el Tammany Hall y prácticamente monopolizaban las direcciones de los distritos permaneciendo en el poder a pesar de la población cambiante de sus vecindarios. Muchos judíos y alemanes fueron admitidos e iniciados en la secreta Tammany Society. La Orden Colombina es sagrada por la memoria de Colón y su idolatría a la diosa Columbia, que representa a la madre tierra y a la patria, la diosa de la libertad, entre comillas, por supuesto. En el distrito de la diosa Columbia se encuentra la sede del poder político de los Estados Unidos con sus planos masónicos dedicados a ella. My number one priority is to dismantle the disastrous deal with Iran. This deal is catastrophic for America, for Israel, 
and for the whole of the Middle East. I've studied this issue in great detail, I would say actually greater by far than anybody else. <laughs> no, no, believe no, me. No. Oh, believe me. <laughs> and it's a bad deal. <laughs> Mientras somos distraídos por asuntos domésticos, las citas de Trump sugieren que estamos siendo liderados desde un camino hacia la guerra con Irán y que conducirá a la guerra mundial. La elección de Trump anuncia una alarmante disonancia cognitiva en términos de Irán y la llamada guerra contra el terrorismo. Todos los nombramientos de Trump son defensores de la guerra contra el Islam y culpan a Irán por patrocinar el terrorismo. Mientras que los globalistas jázaros con el magnate George Soros a la cabeza son responsables de inundar Occidente con musulmanes, los sionistas, con el Mossad como cabeza pensante, están avivando las llamas de la islamofobia y organizando ataques terroristas en fechas y emplazamientos clave. Podemos esperar también más ataques terroristas de ISIS para aumentar la histeria de guerra entre las naciones artificialmente enfrentadas. Este es el juego del divide y vencerás. Esto es consistente con la fabricación a largo plazo de los Illuminati de una guerra de civilizaciones entre el Islam y Occidente, que recuerda a la profecía de Albert Pike de una tercera guerra mundial enfrentando al Islam y al sionismo político. Trump, hasta ahora, ha demostrado ser poco más que un agente sionista. Rápidamente retrocedió en una promesa de campaña de ser imparcial sobre el conflicto Israel-Palestina e inmediatamente prometió trasladar la embajada de Estados Unidos a Jerusalén. We will move the American Embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. Down the hall and to the left. Thanks. In 2001, weeks after the attacks on New York City and on Washington, and frankly, the attacks on all of us, attacks that perpetrated, and they were perpetrated by the Islamic fundamentalists, by the Islamic fundamentalists, by the Islamic fundamentalists. Él fingió que los musulmanes celebraron el 11-S cuando es bien sabido que agentes israelíes del Mossad fueron arrestados por esto. Ignoran la evidencia destapada por Wikileaks de que Israel, Arabia Saudí, Bahrein, Qatar y los Emiratos Árabes financian a ISIS y no Irán. Ignoran la evidencia también de que ISIS fue entrenada, armada y apoyada por el Mossad, la CIA y Occidente. Todas estas evidencias las pueden encontrar en un artículo publicado en la revolucionpacifica.com que pondré en la descripción. Todas las citas de Trump apuntan a una confrontación gratuita con Irán orquestada por Benjamin Netanyahu. Esto podría conducir fácilmente a la Tercera Guerra Mundial. Millions of people believe Israeli agents were involved in the attack. And they claim there is a basis for their suspicions. Moments after the planes hit the World Trade Center, eyewitnesses reported seeing a group of young men apparently celebrating. I grab my binoculars and I'm trying, you know, to look at the Twin Towers. But what caught my attention, down there, I see this van park. And I see three guys on top of the van. They seem to be taking a movie, and I could see that they were like happy, you know, they're laughing. They didn't look shocked to me. A major terrorist manhunt began, and just six hours after the attack, the van was stopped at a roadblock by patrolman Scott DiCarlo. We were asked to detain the van and the passengers. They were just removed from the vehicle. 
patted down for safety precaution and, uh, you know, detained. 911 call at 410 Park. We had received an all points bulletin and uh, I just happened to see the van and, you know, I think that could be the van. We checked it out and it was. You know, we were all on edge, obviously, so I really wasn't looking to make friends with these people and neither were the officers that I were with. Once we started talking to them, you know, they were pretty much like, hey, you know, we're, you know, we're not against you, we're with you. Over two months of interrogation began. The FBI discovered the men weren't from Al-Qaeda. They were Israelis. An enduring conspiracy theory began, that they were Israeli field agents who'd uncovered the 9-11 plot in advance. Israel had deliberately failed to warn the US authorities because it wanted to ensure that American public opinion was hostile to the Arab world. Channel 4 traveled to Israel and spoke to three of the five men arrested that day to hear their side of the story. But I told them that I'm just a tourist from Israel, I'm Jewish. And he told me, don't talk, if you talk, I'm going to shoot you. People were spitting on us from the street, they were passing with the cars and spit on us. Because they thought that we are the Arabs, they were looking for someone to blame. A passerby took these photos of the police searching the van. Five men were inside it. Some had dual nationalities and were carrying more than one passport. Others had flight tickets to leave the US within days. Fearing robbery, one had over $4,000 hidden in a sock. They were ripping things, they took the camera, they uh, were screaming at us all, the, all that time. Put your head uh, into the ground or we were gonna shoot you. They told interrogators they were working for Urban Moving, a shipping and storage firm run by an Israeli businessman who often employed Israeli students without work permits. The men say there was an innocent explanation for what was found in the van and their behavior on 9-11. They were, they say, simply on a working holiday. Amazingly enough, we have found the moving company where the five Israelis worked. Was this building being used as a front for some kind of Israeli intelligence operation that possibly was doing surveillance on the Arab American community. Were there men celebrating or slapping fives or whatever? There is a better view from a building in Jersey that is up a hill, a straight line to the World Trade Center. We decided to go up there. It's like two, three minutes from the office. Stand over there and take some pictures. Everyone wants a picture like this in his camera. Everyone wants a picture like this in his camera. Their boss at Urban Moving, Dominic Suter, was questioned by the FBI, but then disappeared back to Israel. It left lots of unanswered questions and fueled suspicion about the five men. Investigators seized the firm's computers and the investigation took on a new urgency with multiple lie detector tests. The FBI wasn't satisfied. Channel 4 has learned from intelligence sources that some of the men's names were already known to American counterintelligence. Paul Kurtzberg admitted serving in an Israeli army anti-terrorist unit. He refused to take a lie detector test for 10 weeks. I was uh, serving in a special unit in the army and it's not a big secret or something like that. But uh, there are things that I have to keep to, uh, to myself as uh, loyal to my country. The story that the feds build is a very good story. When you hear their story, you start uh, even to believe it inside. Okay, maybe I'm a spy. I'm sure that I'm not, but the story is so good. So maybe I am. So maybe I am. So maybe I am. Tuval Aviv is a counter-terrorism advisor to the US Congress, but was once a spy for Israel's secret service Mossad. He says Urban Moving was a front company and that some of its workers were spying illegally in the US. Israel has engaged in intelligence gathering in friendly countries. Some of it is done with permission, and some of it probably has been done without permission in areas that is vital to Israeli interest without permission in areas that is vital to Israeli interest. It's flushed out the possibility that Israel spies on America, its closest ally, 
an espionage tactic that both governments would prefer kept secret. There are certain type of uh, information that, and methods of collections that you don't want to share with a local host country. Uh, systems that you use, um, contacts that you make, um, undercover operations that you penetrating other terrorist networks, uh, those types of information you don't share with anybody. The Urban Moving Five were eventually deported to Israel for visa violations. And at that point, we were taken for another round of questioning, this time related to our allegedly being members of Mossad. The fact of the matter is, we are coming from a country that experiences terror daily. Our purpose was to document the event. Our purpose was to document the event. Uh, the New York City Police Department has a report that the FBI is responding to New Jersey because a truck reportedly uh, loaded with explosives has been stopped by authorities on the road there and um, the men with that truck have been detained. The five Israelis were detained for 10 weeks and finally deported on immigration violations after the FBI cleared them of any involvement in 9-11. And that it was near the George Washington Bridge. There were two or three men who were in the van. The van was pulled over. Uh, it is not clear why the van was pulled over, but when it was, uh, law enforcers found uh, uh, tons of explosives inside of the van. That is right now all I'm hearing. Um, but again, two to three people uh, in custody, and we are trying to get more information on that right now. The FBI has now put out a nationwide APB all points bulletin for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration. Written on the back is Urban Moving Systems. Apparently there are three male occupants. Let's repeat that. The FBI has now put out an APB, an all points bulletin nationwide. They're looking for a white Chevy van with New Jersey registration and written on the back of the white van are the words Urban Moving System. Apparently this van is carrying three male occupants. Obviously, if you see this van, you're asked to contact the FBI immediately.
Trump prácticamente le practicó una felación a los delegados en la conferencia de la AIPAC, el lobby israelí que dirige la política exterior y la economía de Estados Unidos. When I'm president, believe me, I will veto any attempt by the UN to impose its will on the Jewish state. It will be vetoed 100%. When I become president, the days of treating Israel like a second-class citizen will end on day one. Thank you. And as you know, she, most people know, she's a world-class liar. Hillary's a great friend of mine. Uh, her husband is a great friend of mine. They're fantastic people. I mean, you know the thing, uh, they get a bad knock. She's a very nice woman. People think tough, tough, and I guess she's tough, but she's a very nice woman, and he's a very nice guy. We know all about the smarts and how smart they are, and all, but they are good people. There's never been anybody in the history of politics in this nation that's been so abusive to women. Hillary Clinton attacked those same women and attacked them viciously, four of them here tonight. Hillary's a great friend of mine. Uh, her husband is a great friend of mine. They're fantastic people. I mean, but she's a very nice woman and he's a very nice guy. These are all lies. We say lie, 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 lie. Dirty, rotten liar. No, but why did she get rid of it? Hillary, Rotten, Clinton. Rotten, Clinton. Hillary, Rotten, Clinton, right? And they are, uh, you know, just really terrific people. I like them both very much. Hillary has worked very long and very hard over a long period of time. And we owe her 
a major debt of gratitude for her service to our country. I mean that very sincerely. Are you going to ask for a special prosecutor to investigate Hillary Clinton over her emails? Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to think about it. She did some it... bad things. I mean, she I did know, some bad things. I know, but a special prosecutor? You I think don't want to might... hurt them. I don't want to hurt them. They're, they're good people. Hillary Clinton, commonly referred to as Crooked Hillary. She's crooked as a $3 bill. She's married to an abuser. A woman claimed rape and all sorts of things. I mean, horrible things. She should be in prison. She's the queen of corruption. She's a disaster. She is a dangerous liar. She's the devil. She's a monster. Uh, Hillary Clinton, I think, is a terrific woman. I mean, I'm a little biased because I've known her for years. I live in New York. She lives in New York. And I've known her and her husband for years, and I really like them both a lot. And I think she really works hard. And I think she, again, she's given an agenda. It's not all of her, but uh, I think she really works hard, and I think she does a good job. I just like her. I like her, and I like her husband. You'll be looking at the record of Hillary Clinton, and how did she do as Secretary of State? Probably above and beyond everybody else and everything else. If you look at the job she did as Secretary of State and the destruction that she's caused, I just, I don't know what it is, the word evil came to mind. The decisions that they made on so many different fronts as Secretary of State were absolutely insane. You know, I, I'll tell you, there is something that I wanted to say, because I was very honored, very, very honored, when I heard that President Bill Clinton and Secretary Hillary Clinton was coming today. And I think it's appropriate to say, and I'd like you to stand up. I'd like you to stand up. And honestly, there's nothing more I can say because I have a lot of respect for those two people. So thank you all for being here. And uh, we're going to have four great years, hopefully, of peace and prosperity. Trump nombró a Steve Bannon como agente y asesor estratégico de la Casa Blanca. La elección de Bannon se debe a que proviene de Goldman Sachs y del think tank propagandístico Breitbart.com, que fue establecido en Jerusalén Está compuesto por judíos y, sin duda, es un frente del Mossad. Su trabajo es engañar al pueblo estadounidense. Trump también designó a Michael Flynn como asesor de seguridad nacional. Desde su jubilación, Flynn se ha hecho conocido por sus opiniones extremas sobre los musulmanes. En junio, se unió a la junta directiva de Act for America, parte del núcleo interno de la industria de la islamofobia en Estados Unidos una red nacional de ONGs de extrema derecha con acceso a cientos de millones de dólares dedicados a difundir el miedo y la desinformación sobre los musulmanes y la fe islámica. En un discurso pronunciado en nombre de Act for America el 9 de agosto, Flynn repitió la desinformación islamofóbica sobre los musulmanes, incluyendo la noción de que los musulmanes quieren imponer la ley de la Sharia a los estadounidenses. Él dijo, no veo al Islam como una religión, quiero decir, lo veo como una ideología política. Los otros nombramientos de Trump se distinguen por su lealtad a Israel y al sionismo, no a los Estados Unidos. Aquí vamos a desenmascarar a todos los hombres del presidente Trump que han posibilitado que el lema Make Israel Even Greater Again es decir, haz Israel más grande aún otra vez, se pueda producir. President elect Trump, my friend, congratulations on being elected. President of the United States of America. You are a great friend of Israel. Over the years, you've expressed your support consistently, and I deeply appreciate it. 
I look forward to working with you to advance security, prosperity, and peace. Israel is grateful for the broad support it enjoys among the American people, and I'm confident that the two of us, working closely together, will bring the great alliance between our two countries to even greater heights. May God bless America. May God bless Israel. May God bless our enduring alliance. My name is Donald Trump, and I'm a big fan of Israel. And frankly, a strong prime minister is a strong Israel. And you truly have a great prime minister. In Benjamin Netanyahu, there's nobody like him. He's a winner. He's highly respected. He's highly thought of by all. And people really do have great, great respect for what's happened in Israel. So vote for Benjamin. Terrific guy. Terrific leader. Great for Israel. He said he was going to ask a very simple, easy question. And it's not. It's not. Not a, not a simple question. Not a fair question. Okay, sit down. I, I understand the rest of your question. Number one, I am the least <laughs> no, 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 no. anti-Semitic person that you've ever seen in your entire life. Number two, racism. The least racist person. In fact, we did very well relative to other people running as a Republican. Quiet, quiet, quiet. See, he lied about he was going to get up and ask a very straight, simple question. So, you know, it's welcome to the world of the media. I hate the charge. I find it repulsive. I hate even the question because people that know me, and you heard the prime minister, you heard uh, Betanyahu yesterday. Did you hear him? Bibi. He said, I've known Donald Trump for a long time. And then he said, forget it. So you should take that instead of having to get up and ask a, a very insulting question like that. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. What I wanted to say is this. I want to say this out in the open. I support the Jewish state of Israel. They have been in that land. That is their land. And it's the UN that has declared them terrorists. Here, I'm going to stop you right there. I am Jewish. You being, you know, with Good, let them say it. I love you. Fine. I work for Israel. Yes, it's all true. Can we move on now to fluoride in the water and, and, and garbage in the vaccines and all the rest of it? Here, I'm going to stop you right there. I am Jewish.
A modo de conclusión, no olvidemos que el apellido Trump deriva de la palabra tambor o fabricante de trompetas, como ya hemos analizado. Por tanto, no cabe duda de que los tambores y las trompetas del apocalipsis, en forma de la Tercera Guerra Mundial, sonarán con el presidente ventrílocuo Trumpet Trump a la cabeza de la nación más poderosa del mundo y tripulada por ese pequeño estado de Oriente Medio, Israel. Make it fast. I've got a plane to catch. We've created a magazine. Mr. Trump, we give you... Scazzy! <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Dad. It's me. You're gonna be so proud of me. I'm gonna win this race. Samantha, a cosmopolitan, and Donald Trump. You just don't get more New York than that. Waldo, you're the best son money can buy. Thanks, Dad. Look, without Derek Zoolander, male modeling wouldn't be what it is today. Actually, hiring Eddie was my idea from the beginning. Eddie is going to crash and burn and take his clients with him. Excuse me. Well, uh, well, Mike. Sir. Yeah. Donald. Uh, Mr. Trump here wrote The Art of the Deal. Then he wrote a new bestseller, The Art of the Comeback. Two books. Wow. <laughs> hey, Donald. Tell me you were here. You look great. Mm, thank you very much. Um, Donald owns this restaurant. Oh. Uh, this is my friend Mike McNeil. Hey, listen. Are you bagging her? Huh? Look at this right here on the street. It's Donald Trump. <laughs> what are you, morons? Are you? No, no. We, we, we just met. Well, call me Liz. Oh, sure. Thanks. Donald, I am here with Donald Trump. For God's sake, how long is it going to be? I have checks sitting on two tables. Ah, Miss Ayers, how nice to see you. I have Mr. Cuddy's usual table. Wade. Trump. I hear Kelson finally dumped you. Not exactly, no. We just came to a mutual understanding that she couldn't bear me for another second. Sorry, Frank, but I'm going to go crash and burn with Cuddy. Call me. McDonald is here, live, on Monday Night Raw. 